run, my lovely chicken run, my dear run, my lovely chicken run. Thank you for inviting me here. I've just come to Nuremberg uh, after having done a shooting for a television program in Leipzig. I first became interested in yodeling when I was in junior high school. It happened on a school excursion I was taking part in. It was to celebrate our upcoming graduation. Our school excursion's destination was Kyoto. It all happened on the bus and train ride to Kyoto. We were killing our time by exchanging songs with one another. There in the train, we were killing time by singing different songs with each other. Yamano Ninkimono was then a popular Japanese song. One of the words we sang was yodel. Yodel, yodel, yodel. What did this yodel all mean? It intrigued me to no end. Later, listening to radio and television, I was able to figure out part of what puzzled me. And Yamano Ninkimono did puzzle me. Yodel was something more than just a simple word. So what really was yodeling? That bothered me. So in high school, that was the reason why. In the 10th grade, I joined the chorus club. In the chorus club, there was a really good friend of mine. He could yodel. I knew then what yodeling was. I finally knew what yodeling meant in Yama no Ninkimono. I knew what I had to do to get it right. It made me want to get a real yodel record to listen to. It so happened, in my father's company, one of the workers there had yodel records. One was a record of Willy Okiyama, Western Music Yodeling. Another of the records I got was by the King of Bavarian Yodeling, Franzel Long. Yes, he had only two records, but at least I could borrow them. After getting my hands on them, I then made tapes of them. After making the tapes, I could not separate myself from them. I mimicked them. I tried to mimic the yodeling in them. Mimicking became more and more interesting. It was a great feeling I had to feel I was getting better. The more I yodeled, the more I found that I improved. I really got excited learning a song. What I learned was Willy Okiyama's Yama no Ninkimono. That singer's Yama no Ninkimono in Japanese sounded like... Yama no Ninkimono, sore wa miruku ya te... See what I mean? Willy Okiyama began it with It was then the yodeling started. The yodeling really, really impressed me. I wanted others to be impressed. I thought I should sing it for everyone. It was a great song. It was really great. A song that people now would call cool. Really cool. I think you can understand. Mm, I remember one summer when I went hiking. It was really hot, but yodeling, I felt fresh. I didn't feel the heat. Yeah, felt good. Yodeling's meant for summer. Yodeling is a mountain thing. Comes from the Alps, and that's what yodeling is. Mountain music. So three years later, when I was 18, in college I did hiking. My clubmates and I did hiking. Went to mountains, I could yodel. And it was great practice going to the mountains and all. A good workout. And I slowly got better. I made my friends listen. They said my voice was small. But at least I could say I was getting better. Mountains made me stronger. My voice got a lot bigger. But sometimes, you know, yodeling does things. Makes you keep practicing. So much I even lost my voice. For a while I thought I'd ruined it. I was really worried. All on account of my hobby. But even so, I couldn't give up yodeling. And it was about that time, I found a yodel club in Tokyo. And I became a member. I went to monthly meetings. And what surprised me about it, there were so many people. People there who could yodel. It was fabulous. And the instruments they had. Musical instruments from the Alps. They were playing them. Right there, playing them. I could not stop listening. And we did a concert. And a TV station approached us. And whenever performers would come from Europe, performers doing Alpen music, I would make a point of going and get to know them. The yodeling club kept getting bigger and bigger. We can say the result was 
I was on TV and radio. Not always, but sometimes. So anyway, I just knew I had to go to Europe. I'd make a point of asking for souvenirs. They'd bring me back records. I could hear the real thing, real yodeling. Yodeling in Europe was my dream. I started thinking so at 26. Until I was 26, after not finishing university, I helped out in my father's factory. It was something to do. I saved my money and at a restaurant, a Swiss restaurant, and also at a German restaurant. I made money yodeling. I could pay for a trip. So I talked to my father and mother, said, give me one year, one year for Europe, mostly for Germany, to study German, of course, but also machinery. And as for my father, he was easily persuaded. But my mother, I couldn't hide from her. She knew I was going for the sake of yodeling. And I arrived in Europe. It was October 1973. I stayed first in Augsburg. The reason I stayed in Augsburg was because my yodeling club, it was called Alpine Yodeling Friends. Well, one of the club's members, he was teaching German at a German language school. There was a girl, a university student, who came to visit him. She was interested in our yodeling club, so she paid us a visit one day. She became a friend. I started taking private German lessons from her. I told her about my dream. I wanted to go to Europe. She offered me encouragement. She said her parents had a room, that I could stay there. She said, come stay with us. So I started thinking about it. That's why I went directly from Japan to Augsburg in Germany. I stayed there six months. And while I stayed there, she had a friend who was a band leader. Her friend took me where they performed. And someone there said, you do yodeling, don't you? So I did, and I made a big hit. I surprised myself. I realized I was really good at yodeling. I didn't need to feel ashamed of myself. People started paying me a bit to yodel. So after I found six months had passed, when my homestay was then coming to an end, I was able to meet Franz Lang, who is known as the King of Yodelers. He showed absolutely no hesitation in giving me his stamp of approval. In no uncertain terms, he told me that my yodeling was the real thing. He said, you're good, keep yodeling. So I decided to go to Switzerland. The reason to go to Switzerland was because in Zurich, in Switzerland, a Swiss person lived that I'd met in Japan. Where my friend was living, right there in the middle of Zurich, there was a big festival. There was a huge tent. A band was playing. My friend told me, I could yodel. I should try. I did, and they loved me. Then one day, sometime after that, there was this restaurant, a restaurant that had music and all that. I paid a visit, was having a beer. When I said, I can yodel, why don't you let me yodel for you on stage? Then they said, well, why not? After I did, Wow! And because of that, I was asked then and there to do a show for several weeks for them. But the fact was that my visa was a tourist visa. I was in Switzerland on only a three-month tourist visa. It was during this short period of time in Switzerland when newspaper reporters started interviewing me. There were also radio interviews. And finally, two months later, I appeared on television, on a really popular Saturday program. Because of this, a big record company approached me. They gave me a contract. In the course of six months, course of a year, gradually I could build up a reputation. While all this was happening, remaining there in Switzerland as a tourist just wouldn't do. With no residence permit, I found I had to think of some way to stay there longer. It was then that I realized that I needed to think of something and do it fast. Anyway, I needed a visa. I had no plans to go professional, but I had to have a visa, so I became a student. A language school 
to study translation. The plan was one year. It gave me a residence permit. I could stay as a student for one full year. So while going to school, sometimes I performed. It was lots of fun. Having fun soon became a job. So after two years, I was always working. Anyway, working more than study. I realized I couldn't do both, so I quit school. I had confidence I could make a living with my singing. I thought about it. It seemed so easy. I got a new visa, a work visa. Getting a work visa meant I would have no trouble staying in Switzerland. So I could stay. I could stay in Switzerland. Well, that's when I got a girlfriend. One thing led to another, and then in the year 1975, I felt I was ready to become a professional yodeler. It all fell in place for me. Then, for the first time in 1978, I could do an LP. The title of the LP was Takeo Ishii, me. A Japanese who could yodel had an LP. And going here and there around Switzerland, my LP was being sold. But then I found it wasn't as easy as it looked. Traditions there run deep. What could I do? A Japanese yodeling in Switzerland. I wasn't real. The record stores were having trouble selling records by someone who wasn't the real thing. And thinking now about my record, I understand why it stopped selling. After all, my records and my cassette tapes, I had to sell them after my shows. I found I had to be my own sales agent, but there was something more important. Being a professional yodeler in Switzerland meant, well, how can I best express it? I found there were limits to my existence as a yodeler in Switzerland. And then it was in 1980, the host of a television show in Germany, she helped me make a breakthrough. It seems she had listened to a cassette tape of mine. She had others listen to the cassette tape, too. I could be on her program. So for the first time, I was on a major German television program. The show was one that emphasized doing things before no one else had thought of them yet. It was there on that program that I had the privilege of meeting the really famous German folk singer Maria Helwig. And this was the reason I moved back to Germany. So then, in the year 1981, I made my move from Switzerland to a small town in Bavaria called Reit im Winkel. I started living there. And at Maria Helwig's restaurant, it was called Zum Kuhstall at the cow shed. I was a restaurant performer. It wasn't really that big. The stage was a bit small too. It was such a small restaurant. But tourists would come there by the busload to listen. It was really popular. I was working as a regular performer. I did that several years. And while I was doing all this, I went with Maria Helwig on a tour. We were on television and so on. I became famous in Germany. It was then, for the first time, as a Japanese who was good at yodeling, I made a name for myself. I was the man from Japan who could yodel. There was nobody who knew me as Takeo Ishii yet. Well, of course, I thought I had to do something about it. I thought if I changed the spelling of my name, Ishii, to I-S-C-H-I, it would look a little more German. It'd be easier. I made that my stage name. It became I-S-C-H-I, Ishii. And that's how I still spell it. People could call me Takeo Ishii. Well, then, yes, after that, I began to appear more and more on television. I started work with Rubin Records. They thought I was something big. So they decided to put me under contract. They had me making CDs, one right after the other. And then, well, one thing led to another. And coming to Japan, I shot a video two years ago. It was a video that was thought up in America. The Americans, they called themselves the Gregory Brothers. I did what I could to show them around Tokyo. Well, the result for me was my biggest success so far. My video, Chicken Attack, was a big YouTube success. A success. 
Not only in Japan, but in Asia. Not only in Asia, but the world. Everywhere. My name recognition value was something that I suddenly found could be marketed anywhere. What makes me happy about all this is that it's something still continuing. Of course, I could keep on talking. In fact, it would be hard to stop. But I think this is probably enough. Enough to know how I became me. Chicken and the 